Hey, I want to welcome you guys all to church today. Everyone here at Rock Fellowship, we're so glad that you are with us and joining us today. And uh, if you're watching online from home or uh, if you're in Arizona or Alaska, California, wherever you're watching, we're so glad. If you are one of our uh, many youth kids who are down at Art of Worship, and I don't know if you guys are watching, but uh, if that's you guys, hey, we miss you guys. Or many of the young children's family who are super sick, <laughs> I think because of Vacation Bible School. Um, we miss you guys, and we hope to see you guys soon. Um, again, thanks so much for being here. We're so happy to see all of you guys. Today's message is uh, interesting because I've been wanting to preach this message for about two to three months, actually. The idea for this message came two to three months ago, and it was uh, while I was preparing a message for a different series, and while I was preparing, my mind did as it often does. It like kind of goes on its own, and I like kind of goes on a tangent. And as I kind of went on a tangent and started thinking about these things, reading, I started looking up stuff, this concept or this idea for this sermon kind of formed two to three months ago. And I was like, oh, yeah, this would be a great message. I, I, I want to preach this. This is challenging. I think it's going to challenge people. I think it's going to be really good. Uh, but because of kind of like the schedule of church and the series we were doing and Vacation Bible School, like we really couldn't do it until this weekend. Like this weekend was the, the weekend with flexibility and it's actually so perfect because it turned out to be the weekend we celebrate Independence Day, July 4th. Because the topic that I kind of went on a rabbit hole and on a tangent on was on the idea of freedom. And so it was just kind of crazy that we came to this moment. And I was like, oh, this is the weekend that we could actually talk about freedom and this idea that I was kind of like dealing with a, a few months ago. And so this is that weekend we celebrate, July 4th, the fireworks, the barbecues. I don't know what your guys' plans are. I hope you have great plans. But uh, whatever you're doing, July 4th, we all understand, is a celebration of this country and a celebration of, more specifically, I think, freedom, right? That's something that we all value so much here in this country. Like, America is about freedom. It's the land of the free. And um, I want to begin today's message with a point of tension when it comes to freedom. Um, and I know that when you talk about freedom in our country and, and everything going on right now, it can get really dicey. It could seem very political. But today's message, although we are talking about freedom, it is not a political message. I don't have a political agenda as I'm preaching today's message. It is important, however, that we understand what freedom is in Christ. And that's kind of what we're going to be focusing on. And uh, the tension I want to begin with as we begin today's message is this, that the freedom many people value today is not the freedom Jesus valued. Let me say that again. It may make you uncomfortable. The freedom many people value today is not the freedom that Jesus valued. It's different. And today, during this message, we're going to explore how it is Different. And we're going to explore kind of why this is important to understand that it is different and not to assume they're the same thing. And what we're going to look at is as we see that they're different, they're similar but different, and you kind of have to know what you're looking for. And so today's message is called The Land of the Free. And I know, I'm aware that it is spelled wrong. And there's a reason for that. And uh, I want you to be thinking about why did I choose to misspell the word free in this title, the land of the free. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I want to thank you, Lord, for everyone here in this room and everyone watching. And as we discuss a kind of difficult topic, this difficult message, I pray that you would give us discernment. I pray that you give us wisdom, and I pray that you give us humility as we talk about these things. And if there's anything that resonates with us or challenges us or connects with us, I pray that we may lean into that to allow you to do a work in us today. Thank you, Lord. Name me pray. Amen. So as I said, the freedom many people value today is not the freedom Jesus valued. What do I mean by that? In our world today, especially in the Western world, in the United States, in, in, in secular world, and, and that's kind of the term I'm going to use to delineate the different kinds of freedom, is this idea of secular freedom. It's different than what Jesus talked about and what the Apostle Paul talked about when he said freedom. We talked about freedom in Christ. It's a very, very different thing. And uh, this is so important for us to understand because there are people, and you may be in this place right now, or may, you may have experienced this in the past, where your frustration, 
your, your disappointment with church or God or the Bible or Jesus was because there was a confusion between secular freedom and freedom in Jesus. That you were looking for secular freedom in the church. And here's the thing, Jesus does not do secular freedom. And we're gonna talk a little bit about why he doesn't do it, and he has a really, really good reason why he doesn't do secular freedom. But if you look for secular freedom in the church, you're not gonna find it, and you're gonna be disappointed. So if that is your story, that at some point in time, as we kind of unpack this, you're like, yeah, that is what I was looking for, and that's why I don't really like church, and that's why I don't really like Bible, I don't really like God and Christians, is because of exactly that. What I want you to understand is that's not what Jesus is about. And, and you, you were disappointed actually for good reason, but you have to know what Jesus' freedom is really about, and that's what we're going to be unpacking today. So what I want to do today is I want to kind of define secular freedom first. I want to explain kind of what it really is, and it's actually fairly simple. I want to give you a, a, a bi- biblical example of that secular freedom, and then we're going to look at a couple texts when, when Paul, who, who wrote the most about freedom, I think, in the New Testament and the Bible, um, We're going to read about what he said about freedom. It's going to be really clear, I think, what the difference is. So to define um, secular freedom or the freedom that most people and and many of us, including myself, value is, I think, I want to to share a quote with you by a Scandinavian intellectual uh, by the name of Elsa of Arendelle. You guys know who I'm talking about? Elsa of Arendelle, yes, from Frozen. This This is a quote, direct quote from Elsa of Arendelle. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. Do you guys know where this is from? This is from the song, Let It Go. Excuse, right, let, let me sing it for you so that maybe you guys will. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. Okay, all right. Bah, bah, boo, 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 right? So this, 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 I think, quote here is like one of the best, simplest Descriptions of what kind of the, the, the current world's freedom looks like. No right, no wrong, no rules for me, I'm free. What it really comes down to is simply freedom that many people are looking for and value and seeking is this idea of I want to do whatever I want to do. I want to do whatever I want to do, and I don't want anyone to tell me what I can or cannot do. I don't want anyone to tell me and put constraints or limits on me. And and kind of the one caveat is I want to do whatever I want to do as long as it doesn't hurt other people. And that's a fair caveat, right? But that's kind of the general thought and and the value, the freedom that many people value and are searching for in life. And in fact, many of us work hard, study hard, so you can have the means to achieve that freedom. Let's be honest. The reason why you work is so that you can do whatever you want whenever you want and with whoever you want. You work hard to have the money and the resources to go on vacation when you want. You work hard so that one day you can stop working so you can do whatever you want, right? And, and like, I get that. And that's like, honestly, where this beard is coming from, okay? I know you guys are wondering, what's going on, Chris, up there? I don't know how I feel about that. But that's kind of where this is coming from, right? Like, hey, you know what? I just want to try it, right? Like, and I know some of you, and some of you have talked to me like, hey, Hey, man, like, what's going on there? Maybe this is not a great idea. But then some of you, my favorite ones, are like, hey, looking good, looking good. I spoke at the Korean ministry uh, this morning for the earlier service, and, like, so many of them were like, it looks good, it looks good. So it's going to be here for a little while, guys, just, just to know. But, but like, that, that's, that's kind of where, like, I've never done this before. I've never tried it. I had a mustache, and that was a pretty bad failed experiment, so we're not going there. Uh, but I want to try this out, and I know maybe it's not great, but I want to do me. I just want to try it. No one can put constraints on me. No one can tell me you can't have a beard. No one says that you can't do it, right? And so like, I'm kind of living that out. And so I understand there is this value on this freedom of like, I want to do what I want to do. And I don't want people to tell me and limit me and constrain me and stop me from doing the things that I want to do. And um, so, so in that line of thinking, Um, that we we see all throughout secular society. And we talked about this a lot. Like, so many Disney movies is on this theme, right? Like, being who you are, no one can tell you what to do, push back against that, don't listen to your parents, all that kind of stuff. We have a lot of these phrases that are very, very common uh, today. And not only they are common, but they are, like, universally accepted as truth, right? And these are some of those phrases. Things like, follow your heart. 
You do you. Speak your truth. The heart wants what it wants. Be true to yourself. And you guys have all heard these things before. And, and a lot of them sound really, really great. And these are the, the mantras for so many people. And they live their life according to these perspectives and these thoughts. Follow your heart. You do you. Speak your truth. The heart wants what it wants. Be true to yourself. It's all different versions, different ways to say, I want to do what I want to do. And I want to live my life in a way that I want to live my life. And if my parents or the church or, or any other external influence tells me like they're in, inhibiting or hindering my sense of freedom. Right? Like, that's kind of what our world is like, and that's what many of us are seeking. Now, I, I found this out uh, recently that kind of like, whoa, kind of made me like step back, take a moment from especially these phrases. Um, like I found out where some of these came from. So I'm going to go back to that screen. Did you guys know that last one, be true to yourself? Does anybody know where this came from? So it actually came from, or it's, it came from the, the quote, to thine own self be true. Have you heard that one before? And the person who said that is a character in Hamlet. Okay, to be honest, I never read Hamlet, okay? So if, please don't judge me, but this is what I've learned in my research and study, that the character who said to thine own self be true, for now we have be true to yourself, was Polonius, who is considered the fool of the entire play. He is the fool. But he was the one that said, son, to thine own self be true. And then this other one, this was a shock to me. The heart wants what it wants. I've said this before, okay? I've said this before. I've used it to defend myself. The heart wants what it wants. And maybe you have to, do you guys know where this came from? Some of you might know. Woody Allen, the very, very famous director. Uh, I don't remember when he said it, but he was in an interview, and he said, the heart wants what it wants. Bonus question, anyone know why he said that? He was defending himself because of the relationship he was having with his stepdaughter, who was 35 years younger than him. Eventually, they got, they got married, and they're actually still married today, so good for them. But it was crazy because it was in that moment when he was defending his decision, his romantic relationship with his stepdaughter, who was 30 years younger than him, he said... Well, the heart wants what it wants. I don't know. I'm probably not going to say that phrase anymore. <laughs> it kind of ruined it for me. But these are all, again, versions or manifestations of the idea of like what we really want in life in our secular society, in our Western world, is we just want to do what we want to do. We just want to be who we want to be. We don't want anyone to hinder. And if it's not hurting anyone, then it should be fine. So don't, don't get in my business. Leave me alone and let me do my thing. So the problem, though, number one, follow your heart. It's pretty bad advice. Follow your heart is actually probably one of the worst pieces of advice that you could give to somebody. Follow your heart. There's lots of reasons that we don't get into, into that. But the issue of this idea of I just want to do whatever I want to do, the best biblical example is, is from Mark chapter 5. And let me share this little story with you. Okay, Mark chapter 5, starting from verse 4, it describes a person. It describes a person, and listen to how he's described in Mark chapter 5. It says, For he, man remains nameless, had often been chained hand and foot. But he tore the chains apart, broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Okay, literally, physically, no one could control this person. If they tried to put chains on him, he broke them. Right? He broke the chains. He broke the chains on his feet, on his arms. Anytime anyone tried to subdue him, control him, say, you can't do that, you have to stop. You can't do the things you want to do, you have to stop. We're going to stop you. He, no, one could get, no one could get in his way. Like, this is, he literally could do whatever he wanted to do. Okay? Um, he's actually, his story is also in Luke. And we find out that this guy, who had like, is almost like super powered, where he could do anything he wanted to do, he's also shown as someone who rejected social norms. Right, like society and the culture said, you have to do this. And he's like, nah, I'm not going to do that. And we know this because the description of him in Luke chapter 5 is that he walked around naked. He's like, society was like, dude, you need to wear clothes. And he's like, no, I don't want to wear clothes. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And so he like just is, is powerful. He is strong. No one can control him. No one can stop him. He rejects social norms. Like this is the guy who I feel like is the best example of this kind of like secular freedom. He does what he wants to do. No one can stop him. We'll read, read on in the verse. 
Night and day among the tombs and in the hills he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Okay, it's getting weird now, right? This is getting weird now. And so some of you guys know where I'm getting. If you grew up in the church, you know what story I'm talking about. He's introduced a few verses later, or verses earlier in verse 2, when it says, When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. So we're talking about this guy who no one could control, no one could subdue, the guy who did whatever he wanted. He didn't even wear clothes. He was possessed by an impure spirit or by a demon, and Jesus eventually saves him. We're going to talk a little bit about that a little bit. Now, I am not trying to say that everyone who is seeking this kind of like Western freedom, like you want to do what you want to do, it means you're possessed by a demon. No, I am not saying that. All I'm simply saying here is this. That, is it, that it is possible that the search for this kind of freedom is actually a version of captivity. That you could look for freedom, and in the process of trying to be more free, to be able to do whatever you want, you actually become a captive. And like, it's weird to use these words, but the words that the Bible writers use, Apostle Paul says, that as we look for this kind of freedom, we actually become enslaved. That there is a form of freedom that is also slavery. That's the words that Paul uses. And so this gets really, really interesting because Jesus meets this guy, this demoniac is what we call him. He frees him from his his demon possession and he releases the demons and everything. And he's now sitting there in his sound mind. Do you know what he says to Jesus? He says, Jesus, let me come with you. Like this man, when he is now freed from his demon possession where he could do whatever he wanted to do, had strength of 10 men, had power. In that moment, he looks at Jesus and says, I want to attach myself to you. I want to go where you go. I want to do what you do. I don't want to do what I want to do. I want to follow you. Right? So, and then Jesus says, actually, no, you can't come with me. I have a different mission for you. You go to the towns and tell everyone what had happened here. So he... Look at this story. Think about what's happening. This guy who is now freed from this version of freedom that is actually slavery, is actually captivity, he now chooses to limit and constrain himself in a relationship with Jesus. And then by doing so, the story ends with this straight statement, everyone was amazed. So we're getting a glimpse as to what freedom in Jesus actually is and how it's beginning to, it's beginning to form, how it's different from kind of this secular freedom where I'm going to call freedom in self. So I want to, I want to put these two together. Secular worldly freedom, the one that many of us value and desire that even I struggle with, is really a freedom in self, but it's contradicted and contrasted with freedom in Jesus. And that's what we're going to talk about for the next couple Minutes. So what is this freedom in Jesus and how is it different? I'm just going to read a couple of verses from Galatians. The Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, who we get most of our theology and beliefs about salvation and Jesus, comes from the writings of Paul. He wrote the most on freedom. And listen to what he said. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Awesome, right? Everyone get down with that. That sounds really good. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Absolutely, right? Let's, we're free. Let's stay free. Go freedom. Fantastic. Everyone's on board. But then he keeps talking, and he keeps talking about this freedom. And listen to what he says in verse 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Cool. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Wait, 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 wait. But I thought my freedom is I can do whatever I want to do. And I can go wherever I want to go and and, and do whatever I want to do, whatever I want to do with whoever I want to do it with. But he says, no, no, no. You were called to be free, but don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. This is a really interesting point. Because what Paul does here is he, he says basically that the opposite of indulging the self is serving other people. Okay? The opposite of indulging the flesh is serving others humbly. All right, so the Apostle Paul is, is setting up this idea of freedom that is very different 
than the one that we're used to right now in this world today. He says, don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Don't use your freedom to just do whatever you want to do. That's not what Jesus called you to. That's not the freedom that Jesus brought. And then he goes on to say, verse 16 and 17, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that, look at this phrase here, you are not to do whatever you want to do. So there's a tension here. There's something kind of weird here because it seems like Paul says you are free, but at the same time, you are constrained. You are free, but you are limited. You are free and you can do whatever, but actually you can't. Like, this is a weird tension that Paul is bringing up here when he talks about freedom. He says this in Romans chapter 6. What then shall we, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the ones you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. To sum this up, Paul has a very, very hot take. Okay? This is like a very fiery take. What Paul is saying here is that you have been set free, but in your freedom, whatever you choose to do, you actually become under something again. You choose another master. So here's like the weird thing that Paul is really getting at here. What he's saying is autonomy is an illusion. Autonomy is an illusion. Self-governance, like you making the shots for yourself, you controlling yourself, it's like that's not a thing. In Paul's mind, we are not autonomous, no matter what. When we accept that Christ has set us free, we're free, but we're free to do what? To choose a new master, is what Paul said. And you don't get to pick yourself. Paul said there's only two choices. You can either choose sin, which leads to death, or you can choose God, who leads to life. Like, that's it. There's no, there's no, I just want to choose me. I just want to do what I, I want to be in control of my own life. Paul would say to you, if you're like, I want to be in control of my own life, he's like, well, actually, you're under the control of sin. So if you choose you, you're actually choosing sin. He's like, you actually can't choose to be fully autonomous in and of yourself. It's, it's an illusion. It's an illusion. Right, so this is like very, very confusing because the freedom that he's talking about today the freedom in Christ has limits. It is not what you can do whatever you want to do. He says, no, 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 no. You don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. So what is he really talking about? Like, How can we really understand what freedom in Christ is? How can we understand what freedom in Christ is, especially in comparison to what freedom in self or secular freedom is? And can you see how if you were searching for secular freedom in the church and you found that the freedom that the church and Jesus offers is actually very different, you could be disappointed. Because Jesus is basically saying, sorry, you can't do whatever you want to do. That's not freedom. In fact, that is slavery. That is captivity. So how can we understand what freedom in Christ is all about? I think this is one of the best quotes from Tim Keller in the book, Making Sense of God. He says this. He says, we see that freedom is not what culture tells us. Real freedom comes from a strategic loss of some freedoms in order to gain others. It is not the absence of constraints, but it is choosing the right constraints and the right freedoms to lose. You see, what Paul is saying here, what Tim Keller is saying here, what Jesus talked about when he says freedom is the freedom that we have in Jesus is we now get to choose who we will serve. Whereas before, we didn't. Before, we had no choice but to serve our sinful nature. We had no choice when we were in sin but to serve the, 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 the indulgences of the flesh, what the flesh told us to do, the desires of our flesh. We had no choice. But Jesus came, he died on the cross, and he freed us, and he says, now you get to choose. The freedom that Jesus offers is the freedom to choose a new master. The freedom in Jesus is the freedom to choose the right constraints, to use Tim Keller's words here. 
The freedom in Christ is completely different than this freedom that we have in the world. Right? The freedom in Jesus is the freedom to choose the right constraints. The freedom that we have in Jesus is the power to choose what is good over what is pleasurable or convenient in the moment. The power and the freedom of Jesus is the ability to ch- not to choose, is to choose to not do whatever I want to do. Are you with me? Right? The secular world, the secular freedom says you get to do whatever you want to do. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. The freedom that I offer you is actually the opposite of that. It is to choose not to do whatever I want to do. See, secular freedom is the ability to do whatever I want to do to indulge my sinful natures, but freedom in Jesus is the ability and the power and the strength to choose not to indulge my sinful nature in order to grow into a person of love, kindness, and compassion. The freedom that we have in Jesus is the freedom to to choose and the ability to choose and to make the decisions that will help us to become more like him. It is not the decision and the freedom to do whatever we want to do. It is actually the opposite. It is the freedom to choose not to do whatever I want to do. It is the freedom to choose to not insist on my needs and my desires and my wants and what I think is right and to do that over other people. The freedom in Jesus is the ability and the strength to push back against our sinful nature and to not be selfish and not to demand our way over other people. See, when you you are able to put others before yourself, you are being free. When you are able to serve others, you are being free. And it's weird because sometimes it doesn't feel like you're free, does it? When you are able to put others before yourself, you can't really do what you want to do. But according to Jesus and according to Paul, that's when you're actually the most free, is when you can choose what is good over what is pleasurable. When you are able to practice self-discipline, you are being free. Like when you are able to, in that moment, you're able to turn off the game and sleep at a reasonable hour, you are being free. When you're able to resist that late night stack, that, that 12 o'clock midnight lamion, when you're able to say no to that, then you're being free. When you're able to practice self-discipline, you are actually being free. When you're able to speak openly and honestly for the good of someone else, then you are being actually truly free. When you are able to keep your mouth shut for the good of others, you are being free. Even though, even though the gossip is so juicy, right? When you're able to shut your mouth and say, no, no, this is gossip, this will be harmful, this will hurt the community, that is when you are actually free. When you are able to take time for healthy self-care in this world and society that says go, 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 push, 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 and be busy and produce and do all those things, and that's how you have value, when you are able to take a moment to take care of yourself in a healthy way, you are being free. When you are able to forgive other people, you are being free. When you're able to give up your parking spot to someone else, you're being and living in freedom. When you are able to sacrifice and serve and give, even if it hurts, that's when you are free. This is a completely different kind of freedom than the freedom that our world longs for today. Now, to be fair, I want to say that there are definitely many other social pressures and cultural pressures and and, and expectations and constraints that the church has put on people that actually are very unbiblical and and, and very harmful over the years. And I'm not talking about those. I'm not talking about the things that, that the, the way that the church is, is telling you to be the certain way and, and stopping you from all these things and, and, and legalism. It's not that. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the desires of your sinful nature, that part in you, the, the, the thing in you that longs to just be satisfied, that wants to do whatever it wants to do with, with no regard for other people, that part of us, that's the part that needs to be constrained. See, Jesus was the perfect example of this. You see, Jesus was the perfect example because he pushed back against the social norms and cultural norms and things that the religious, religious body did that were unfair and unjust and oppressive. He pushed back and he said no to those things. But at the same time, the description that Ed shared with us today is actually one that I want to share today as well. 
right? From Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 to 8, where it says, Jesus was, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus was the most free man to have ever lived, and he chose to use that, he chose to use that freedom to sacrifice and serve others. He was the one person that truly deserved to be served, yet he came to serve others. And he was the most free man to have ever lived. See, we understand and looking at his example and, and these texts from, from the Apostle Paul that freedom in Jesus is so different than freedom in self and is so different than the freedom that this world is searching for. But I don't know, but I don't know about you, but it seems like freedom in Christ, the decision to choose to say no to certain things, to say yes to better things, to say no to the things that will lead us to a place of, of, of wickedness and a place where we become people we don't want to be. And the freedom and the power to choose the things that lead us to become more like Jesus. I don't know about you guys, but I feel like that's what I want. And I feel like that's the freedom that you want. Like when you think about it for a moment, you know that you cannot live your life just doing whatever you want, whenever you want. And you know there's a problem with that. And maybe in some times, like, it works, like, when it comes to facial hair and what you're going to eat and stuff like that. But you know in your heart, like, man, there's something that's not right. And the reason why you know that is because you look at our world today, and our world today is the product of that. And when you're like, man, this world is broken, like many people have said over the last couple of years, this world is broken and it's really messed up. The proof is in the pudding. This is where this freedom takes us. But the freedom Jesus offers is the one that gives us the power and the ability to say no, to invite the right constraints. So here's what I want to, to end with. Here's my challenge and my, my, my thought for you to take away. If you forget everything else, this is the message I want you to take home with you. Do not seek to live a life with no constraints. Seek to live a life with the right constraints. Don't seek a life where you can do whatever you want to do. Seek a life where you are able to say no to the things in order to do the things and make the decisions that will satisfy the deepest desires of your heart. That is freedom in Jesus. It is the freedom that allows us to satisfy the deepest, inmost desires of our heart. And I know not all of us know what those are. But I think it would be really powerful if you were to take a moment this week or, or in the next couple of weeks to sit down and figure out, what do I really want in life? Like, what are the deepest desires of my soul? Not, not like, what, what, what I really want, like, the strong, like, I really want a nap, right? Like, I know lots of us want naps. I'm not talking about that. Like, what, at the end of the day, really is the things that you want? What are those few things? And I think as those things become clear, and that's a very, it's very important that we do that exercise with Jesus in the spirit, in prayer, to ask, God, to ask God to show us what are the deepest desires of our heart. And I think once we can see those things and we put them down on paper, we write those things down and we compare them to our lives, we'll see that there may be a disconnect. And I want to encourage you to look at that and reflect on, evaluate your life and whether your life is leading you to a place where you will achieve and receive those things. That's what the freedom of Jesus allows you to do. To live a life, to be a person, to be the kind of person who is fully and truly satisfied. Not to just do whatever you want to do, because Jesus knows that life is empty. That life is meaningless. And that in order for us to find purpose and meaning, we must be willing to put on some limits, to choose the right constraints to lead us into that place. That is freedom in Jesus. And that's what your heavenly father wants for you. And that's what I want for you. And that's why the church is supposed to work. The church is supposed to work because that's the freedom we're supposed to have in this place. Not the freedom to do and say whatever you want to do, but the freedom to be able to choose to do the right thing even when it hurts. 
The freedom to not say the thing. The freedom to keep your mouth shut. The freedom to share the encouragement. The freedom to to love one another, even though we may believe differently about a lot of different things. The church is supposed to work because that's the kind of freedom that's supposed to be in this place. It is amazing, and this is what I think God wants for us in this community, and I think what he wants for you. So as we celebrate July 4th and and freedom and independence, do all the things that you're going to do. Have a great time. Eat a lot of good food. Watch fireworks. Do all that kind of thing. But take a moment. Take a moment to think about the freedom that Christ is offering you and whether we are taking full advantage of that. Do not seek to live a life with no constraints. Seek to live a life with the right constraints. Let's pray. Father in heaven. Uh, Thank you so much for uh, bringing us to this place. And I know for me personally that I I really need to take that time to to discover what are the deepest desires of my soul, Lord. Because I know that when I I take a moment to think about that, I'm going to realize that that my life may be misaligned or out of whack. But God, I know what you want for me. And I know what you want for me is good. And I know the freedom that you offer us is good. It may not look like what we thought we wanted. It may not look like what the world offers. But God, what you want, what you offer is far greater, is far better. And so God, I ask for us, I ask that you would be with us and help us, Lord, to have that conviction, to have the discipline, to realize that the life you want for us is one that is good, that will lead to life, but it is one that requires us to make sacrifices, to invite and welcome certain constraints and limits. And Father, let us live a life in that kind of freedom, the freedom that will take us to become more like you, that will take us to a place where we are who we were called to be. In your name we pray, amen.